Jake, if you can just keep an eye on um, on the muting, that would really, I'd really appreciate it. Especially once we get into it as uh, people come on. Um, okay. So the only people that should not be muted are the panel um, and Ellie. And everybody, right. else, everybody else should be, uh, should be muted. Okay. Yeah, so, wait, we have another waiting for name person. That's that's where the noise is coming from. Waiting for names, and I can't I can't mute him from my from my computer. I may be able to. So, yeah, I can I can. You can do it. Okay. So at this point, uh, at this point, the meeting room is full, which means that everybody else coming in. Um, going to be using the phone so Ellie that's good news because it means we've got at least 51 people in the meeting room and yeah. uh, we'll we'll see how wonderful many we get um, we get online I think we'll get a lot more people online so um, let me this is Rick Davis um, I'm the founder of uh, answer cancer foundation and we're honored to um, welcome Dr. Ellie Van Allen from the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project um, to speak to us today. Uh, we're presenting along with us too, which is another honor and a great joy that um, you can collaborate with us too. And a big thanks to them for getting the word out to all of their 14,000 members. Um, and I'm sure that once we're done here, um, we will, uh, and we post this onto uh, our website, then they will send that out too. So there should be a lot more people coming in subsequent. Um, I suspect we'll be hearing these little dings in the background for a while as, as, as people try to join. Um, we've told everybody that once the meeting room is full, they can, they can join by telephone. and. Um, I think it usually dings when when the telephone um, when the telephone connection comes in. Um, I'm going to give you a quick word about Answer Cancer Foundation, um, and then uh, go through a couple of housekeeping issues, and then Chuck will introduce Ellie, and uh, we will get into the into the presentation. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, and when I come to the housekeeping, I'll tell you exactly uh, how to submit your questions. So, Answer Cancer Foundation uh, has been around now for a couple of years, um, but really quite a bit longer. We emerged out of the Reluctant Brotherhood, and one of the things that we were doing that very few other uh, health groups were doing of any sort um, not restricted to prostate cancer was we were holding virtual support calls and so uh, our goal was not just to continue virtual support calls for prostate cancer but to expand into other cancers and other conditions uh, today we host 15 calls a month uh, most of them are for prostate cancer but we also have a couple of breast cancer women's breast cancer calls a month we have a men's breast cancer call uh, we have four calls a month for uh, a men-only call, which is an emotional support group call uh, for men with any type of cancer. And um, did I cover everything? Oh, and we have a caregiver's call. Yes, we, 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 we have a caregiver's call um, tomorrow. I'm just muting my phone. Um, 
So uh, if anybody on the line is interested in any of our other calls, take a look at our website. I'll put that in the chat window. For those of you on the phone, it's ancan.org. Um, or send me an email um, to info at ancan.org, and I'll make sure you get the information. Um, all our calls are free and drop in. Uh, so uh, just try us out, see if you like, like what we do. The calls are all peer moderated. Um, and most of our calls are not recorded. The only call that we do record is the advanced cancer call because we have a lot of people who like to listen in later. There's, there's a lot of good information. And those calls you can find on YouTube or on our own ANCAN website. So just a few housekeeping issues. If you have any questions, either put them in the chat window um, at, or uh, send them to info at ancan.org and we'll, we'll make sure they get asked. But I will say um, to you that the question should be pertinent to the metastatic prostate cancer project uh, and the and issues mm -hmm. around gene sequencing. Um, we are not planning, unless Dr. Van Allen um, has the time and the inclination to make this a general open forum on, on metastatic prostate cancer. So um, please try and keep your questions pertinent to the, um, to the subject. Uh, secondly, we are recording this call. <clears throat> it will get posted on the ANCAN website under the metastatic prostate cancer um, page, on the metastatic prostate cancer page, which you'll find under that general heading of resources. And hopefully that will be done uh, tonight. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, if anybody wants to be added to any of our groups, for prostate cancer, we ran, we run a low and intermediate group twice a month and we run a weekly um, high-risk, recurrent, and advanced call. And if you send us, send me your email, send it to info at ancan.org, I will make very sure that you get added to the distribution. We send out a weekly um, advance notice. So with that, um, I am delighted to Welcome Chuck Strand, who is the CEO of us too. And um, Chuck's going to introduce Ellie, and from there we'll move right into the presentation. Chuck, floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Rick. It's great to be here. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, part of the webinar. Um, us too is a prostate cancer nonprofit that's focused on providing educational resources, support services, and personal connections to the prostate cancer community. And specific to support services, we have more than 200 uh, support groups across the country and abroad, in addition to the Inspire online community and, of course, the uh, collaboration with Answer Cancer Foundation for the uh, virtual support uh, um, calls that are happening several months. So um, we're very pleased to be here and, and uh, be working with, uh, with Rick and at the webinar here. With, uh, and I also want to thank the Broad Institute and Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Eliezer Van Allen. He is an oncologist and prostate cancer researcher and leads the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project. Dr. Van Allen is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, a clinician at Dana Farber Partners Cancer Care, and an associate member at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. His research focuses on computational cancer genomics, the application of new technologies such as massively parallel sequencing to precision cancer medicine and resistance to targeted therapeutics. As both a computational biologist and medical oncologist, he has specific expertise in clinical computational oncology and development of algorithms to analyze and interpret genomic data for clinically focused questions. Overall, his research will make important contributions to the field of precision cancer medicine and resistance to targeted therapeutics via expertise and study in translational and clinical <clears throat> bioinformatics. Originally from Los Angeles, California, he studied symbolic systems at Stanford University, obtained his MD from UCLA, and completed a residency in internal medicine at UCSF before coming to Boston and completing a medical oncology fellowship at the Dana-Farber Partner 
Partners Cancer Program. So uh, Dr. Van Allen, we thank you for being here and sharing your expertise, and we look forward to your presentation. Fantastic. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Rick. So first of all, I guess maybe first I'll actually check and see. Now that now actually I'll do some technical double checking here. Um, one, do you guys see the full screen slides? We did, but I just did I just lose them? Yes, we just oh. just went black. We, just, we had them oh, right weird. there. We had them. Oh, you know what? I, I think I know why. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad I there asked. Go. I'm going to try again. Um, and now I'm going to share the entire screen. And now I'm going to try that one more time. Okay. And how are we doing now? We just see. Now I see it. We, you do see it? There you go. I do. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's, that's, that's good. good. Now can we you see it? it? Now we got it. Yes. Everyone's got it. Fantastic. So it. we're in biz, Eddie. We're in business. That's that's the miracle of so. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Rick. Thank you to Answer Cancer. Thank you to us too. Um, as you'll see over the course of this project, this is really a this is a patient-driven team project that we wanted to talk to you guys about, um, and it's genuinely a privilege to be able to you know talk with a large community of patients and patient advocates who are really at the center of what we're all trying to achieve together. So um, this is really a credit to, to you all for taking the time and, and thank you all for this and thank you to the organizers for actually putting this together. So um, uh, I also thanks for the introduction. Uh, what I really wanted to talk to you guys about was something called the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project, um, which as you stated in the slide is partnering directly with patients to accelerate our understanding of metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and, um, but what I always like to do before I give a presentation is, and this is something we were trained in, in academic medicine, is we always have to disclose, you know, who, who do we do our consulting for, or are we on the advisory board of companies? And I always like to do this because it also helps to sort of segue into giving a little bit of more color as to who I am. Um, so there's my consulting and advisory roles. There's the companies that I help out. Um, but I'm proud to say that I'm an equity holder in Microsoft because I did receive five shares for my bar mitzvah in 1993. Um, and there's, there's a picture of me um, from that back then. As you can see, if any of you saw the webcam of me a few moments ago, I had a, a lot more hair and it was a lot darker uh, around, you know, circa that time. Uh, but that's okay. Um, but I also like to sort of use that as a segue and to sort of give a little bit of more background to sort of how somebody like me ended up in medicine and ended up in cancer medicine specifically because it's definitely not the sort of tried and true path. So as you heard, um, I went to Stanford in the late 90s, early 2000s, and I studied something called symbolic systems, um, which is, you know, as I explained to my parents who were wondering what on earth they're paying this tuition for, um, is actually in essence a computer science degree. And most of my friends who pursued computer science or symbolic systems at Stanford around that time um, went off to make companies, uh, including companies you've probably heard of, Google, Facebook, um, so on and so forth. Uh, and that was actually, frankly, to be perfectly honest, that, that was my plan. That's what I was going to do. <clears throat> that seemed like a tried and true path. And, you know, it, sort of a funny thing happened about halfway through my time in college. Um, I helped some friends of mine who were starting something called Camp Kesem. It's a camp for kids whose parents have or had cancer. And I, frankly, up until that point, as like a 19 year old, I had no idea, um, frankly, at all about the world of cancer. I knew nothing. I was just a very, frankly, you know, ignorant kid. And um, I wanted to participate in this because I was curious to see how, you, how to build something from scratch. That was basically the, the sort of the premise of, that really drew me in. And it turned out that that was actually a life changing experience for me. Um, meeting the, the parents, meeting their kids, seeing how different families were coping with cancer, seeing the effects of cancer on families in, in you know, the families in whom the, the person with cancer had passed away, the person with cancer survived, but with serious side effects and, and how, and, and then the families in whom they survived and who, in whom their kids were, had serious issues as a result of this was, was genuinely life-changing. And, and that's actually what made me go into medicine. So I went into medicine. Um, purely, I would say, for I would say humanistic reasons. I wanted to go help people. It was as simple as that. Um, and 
what I found as I started to jump into this field a little bit more deeply is that I kind of had a, a strange background for being a doctor. Because again, I had studied all this computer science. I was a computer nerd who so accidentally went to medical school. And if you fast forward a little bit of time later, I've sort of what's happened and sort of what the, the more more elegant version of the introduction uh, that, that you already, the elegant version is, uh, is what you heard Chuck actually introduced me with. But the honest answer is I sort of found myself as the only person sort of in the center of three three things happening in cancer medicine. I was a clinician, so again, I see patients. I saw patients this morning in the clinic at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, including a couple of patients with metastatic prostate cancer. Um, again, I was, I'm a computer nerd. Uh, I like to write code, and I like to answer questions using large amounts of data, and I, I'm in the field of cancer. I'm, I'm in oncology, and what, what this field is, and this is something that sort of doesn't really exist anywhere because we're kind of, it's happening in real time, is this notion of clinical computational oncology. Here, the patient is what we study. We're not here to study mice. We're not here to study cells in a Petri dish. We're here to study patients, study patients and their tumors with the hope that this is actually gonna lead us to new discoveries that can help people immediately. Um, we're computer nerds, so we want to actually throw all of the weight of sort of everything we've learned in computer science and data science and big data onto the data that we're generating from our patients. And we want to blend it into the world of cancer biology that actually has become sort of such as ripe and exciting field to be in from a scientific perspective. And so that sweet spot right in the middle, that's most exciting. Now, this is sort of how I sort of landed my way into this field. Um, and in and of itself has been exciting, but sort of happened at around the same time as a brand new concept was also happening in parallel. The idea of precision cancer medicine. The idea that in essence, rather than treat patients the way we normally do, which is really sort of having nothing to do with the actual properties of the tumor, the genetics of the tumor, or the genetics that the patient was born with, we should use that information to make informed decisions. So there's a very dramatic example. This is not a patient with prostate cancer. Can you see my mouse as I point? Uh, no. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes. yes. Okay, right. So this is a patient with metastatic melanoma, um, and all those bumps and oops, and lumps are actually metastases from this patient's melanoma. Um, what we would have done with this patient up until about 2011 or so was give this patient a chemotherapy called decarbazine. Um, the response rate, the number of patients who respond to this drug is about 5%. Um, and if you're wondering what placebo response rate is across all cancer studies, it's about 5%. Wow. As it happened, um, this patient got a genetic test of his tumor, had a specific genetic change in a specific gene. So in essence, one letter across the entire genome so all three billion base pairs changed from one thing to something else. It mutated. And that change or that mutation created a, a different version of the gene called BRAF. Now, as it happened, we found that. And there was a drug we could give to that patient tailored to that genetic event. And this was the patient, you know, a few weeks after starting this drug. It's the same person. And we started to see these things happening. And as you might imagine, this general idea is really compelling. And we really want to bring this to all of cancer medicine, all to all the patients. This is what we're trying to go after. Um, and of course, you know, so that's a really exciting example in, in, in a different disease, but we're here to talk about metastatic prostate cancer. These are the patients that I take care of. Um, just so we're clear on definitions, metastatic prostate cancer, from my perspective, is prostate cancer that is spread beyond the tissues of the prostate. It's left the gland. Um, there's a lot of different ways to define it, uh, and people, different people will have slightly different variations. And we've already learned, as we've introduced this project, that like it's, it's kind of a complicated question, complicated phrasing to actually describe it. This is for the purposes of, of this presentation and for the purposes of this project. That's what metastatic prostate cancer is. Um, we know there's about 150,000 men living with metastatic prostate cancer in the United States alone you know, as, as, as we speak. About 30,000 men die of metastatic prostate cancer every year. And though you know, there's many new treatments and you know, we're at the center of a lot of this, we don't have really a cure for this disease. Um, and that's what we're all trying to do. That's what we're seeking to change is really turning it an incurable you know, really, you know, difficult disease into something that we can cure. Um, 
and so here's some of the questions we're really trying to that, that are really sort of at the heart of what's what's happening in the metastatic prostate cancer space. What are Ellie, all the ch yeah hello yep um, could you every once in a while tell uh, the people that are on the phone what slide you're on? Oh so yes, they, absolutely, of course. So they can follow so, along on the PowerPoint slides. Yeah, absolutely. So we're on slide seven, and I'll okay. I'll do that periodically. And please and you know don't be shy. <laughs> so um, hello. I just thank Jake. That was just me. Sorry. Oh, sure. Um, so some of the questions that are still open in the field that we really would, would help us to actually, you know, change the way prostate cancer is taken care of in the metastatic setting. What are all the genetic changes? Why does some prostate cancer turn into metastatic prostate cancer and others don't? Um, why do some metastatic prostate cancers never respond to the treatments that we already have in our arsenal? Why can prostate, metastatic prostate cancer happen at a young age? Um, what are the differences in metastatic prostate cancer for patients with different ethnic or ancestral backgrounds? We've known for many years that men of African descent who have metastatic prostate cancer have you know, lower responses to the same agents who often do worse to those, to those agents. We have no idea why. Um, and ultimately, how can we develop better treatments for men with metastatic prostate cancer now and in the future? That's what we're trying to do. And really, from our perspective, what we think it's going to take to answer these questions is getting thousands and thousands of men to say, count me in, to share their tumor genomic and you know, inherited DNA information, so-called tumor and germline samples, along with their medical information, so that we you know, can then take all that huge body of big data and throw everything we have at it, you know, from using the latest and greatest algorithms and methods and com computer science to put this whole puzzle together. Um, it's really just to take a step back and so that that's the premise. What do we already know? Uh, and, and it sort of actually is a timely, it's timely to actually give this presentation because our group, my lab, just published a new study, like that actually came online about six hours ago uh, on, a, on, on what we've known based off of a thousand prostate cancer genomes. Um, so what we already know is that the genetics of primary or localized prostate cancer, so prostate cancer that has not left the gland, is very complicated in and of itself. Um, there's many genetic events that can contribute to the development of prostate cancer. Um, which genetic events are actually important for so-called indolent disease, you know, like the, the, the disease that never turns into metastatic prostate cancer or those that often do, is still almost completely unknown. All of that is in primary prostate cancer. The thing is, is that the genetics of metastatic prostate cancer is a lot more complicated. Everything about primary prostate cancer and more tenfold, a hundredfold more complicated. Um, that being said, in the genetics of, pro of a metastatic prostate cancer, we're seeing some of the same kinds of targets, the same actionable events like that melanoma patient that I showed you at the beginning. We're starting to see them in metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and the reason why we know this is that we've actually had a, a lot of legwork to get us to this point. So along with eight collaborating medical centers across the country and in the UK, uh, we were privileged to be part of a Prostate Cancer Foundation Stand Up to Cancer Dream Team. I don't know if you followed any of these other dream teams. They're, they're, they're very large presence in baseball stadiums across the country and so on. Um, and so our dream team was really centered around trying to sort of take a first stab at this question to look at the genetics of metastatic prostate cancer. Um, we had eight clinical sites uh, spanning, again, numerous institutions that you may have heard of, Dana-Farber, University of Michigan, um, Institute for Cancer Research in, in the United Kingdom, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Wild Cornell, University of Washington, Carmanos. Um, we, were, we accessed hundreds of tumors from patients with metastatic prostate cancer. We did you know, genome sequencing at the Broad Institute and the University of Michigan. Um, folks like myself actually did all the analysis, and we could then integrate this information and make clinical decisions based off of this data in real time. And that study, so the, the aggregate sort of results from that from that effort, which began in about I would say 2011, um, were first reported in 2015 and had an immediate clinical impact. So the first 150 men who participated in that project that comprised that study, and I'm gonna bookmark that 150 men over the course of five years, okay? You bookmark that for later, because we're gonna come back to those numbers. Um, just that data alone had a huge impact. So one thing we discovered 
is that in metastatic prostate cancer, a lot of men have mutations in a gene called BRCA2. It's a similar gene to the one that Angelina Jolie reported uh, in breast cancer. And that immediately opened up some new treatment options for men who have these mutations. Drugs called PARP inhibitors, old fashioned chemotherapy that we thought was basically not gonna be helpful for this disease suddenly had a new use case. And we also found that you know men with this um, with these mutations could, could actually benefit from genetic testing for both them and their families. This actually had impact beyond the, any individual man with metastatic prostate cancer. This had impact for their, for their daughters, their sons, their brothers, their sisters, because some of these events were actually part of the DNA that they were born with. And finding this information could have major impact and major, could, could prevent cancers from happening in, in their family. Um, we found a whole class of mutations in a, in a certain gene pathway, um, a set of genes called the PI3 kinase pathway. Uh, the details of that are, are not important. The important thing is, is that it actually opened up this huge new avenue for clinical trials uh, using compounds that we thought were going to be completely useless for this disease. Now, all of a sudden, we had a rationale, and, and now there are multiple ongoing clinical studies. We also found uh, very rarely, so there were only a handful of patients who had just a wildly increased number of mutations in, in their genomes compared to the rest, and it turned out those patients all had a very specific genetic defect in the tumors that actually indicated they would, be, they would respond to this emerging class of immunotherapies that have gotten a lot of lay press. So we could probably spend like hours and hours sort of dissecting the details of each of these points on this slide. But the point I wanted to make really is that this was, this all came from genetic testing of 150 men with metastatic prostate cancer that took about four to five years. Um, but that's not the only thing that's happening. And this is actually some data courtesy of our friends from the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Um, these are actually the, a, a full gamut of, of different drugs and targets that are currently in development for prostate cancer or in other cancers that are now being um, sort of you know, brought into the prostate cancer armamentarium because, again, of the genetics that we can find. Um, and it's not, you know, the details of each one of these isn't necessarily important. The point is more that there's just this huge avenue that's potentially there for men with advanced prostate cancer when we can have this genetic information if we can make the right discoveries and learn enough from the data that we have to make this meaningful. Because that's actually what, you know, sort of some sense at the crux of why, why I'm here talking to you this evening. Because, you know, I sort of gave you this, you know, this is sort of where we're going. This is our hope. But, you know, that really collides with the reality, I think, of what I have to face every Monday morning, which is my clinic day, which is to ask this question of how far have we actually come? Because in 2016, again, almost 30,000 men died of metastatic prostate cancer. We're still getting hundreds of thousands of men diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer every year, and we can't cure this disease. Um, and again, We've gotten now, so we started with 150 men over four years. We're at over 400 men over six years from that original study, and that's amazing. Um, but we don't really have any idea what happened to those men. We don't have any a sense of what drugs they got, what happened when they got those drugs. What did the genetics mean for that? We don't have that context to make it meaningful and to, occur, to sort of accelerate the next wave of discoveries that are going to be needed to put this puzzle together. And we just have so much to learn. And so I think the, the, the radical idea here, which may seem, I don't know, perhaps may seem strange to you guys, but I know is a strange thing in sort of the up on high academic sort of way we usually do research in cancer or really in medicine in general, is to, instead of sort of starting with these ideas and starting with these projects in, in the office of some famous physician or some famous scientist and sort of trickling down such that the, the only touch point that a patient ever feels when they participate in these things is that moment when they get a consent form and they sign it and then sort of it all goes disappears. Can we flip the whole idea on its head? Can we actually instead have patients drive the field forward, have patients drive the research projects and put them at the center of the creation of this kind of a project? And that seems like a really exciting idea, and that's really at the crux of what we're doing here, but it's, it's actually hard. Um, it's not easy to actually study patient tumor samples. Um, most patients, 
do not ever enroll on a clinical trial where these kinds of analyses are more regular. And most patients are instead treated in community settings where they'll never walk foot into one of those eight institutions I mentioned earlier to even participate in this kind of research. And historically, that's been the major barrier. We've just never been able to overcome that because you can't take Dana-Farber and move it all across the country. You can't take Memorial Sloan Kettering and move it from the Upper East Side of Manhattan to, you know, like, you know, New Mexico or Arizona or California and, and so on and so forth. And that's been why none of this has ever happened before. But now, and this sort of it's in some, in some respects obvious, you know, seeing that I'm giving a, a webinar to, you know, I don't know how many men using you know, my laptop sitting in my house speaking slightly softly so I don't wake up my little kids, is that, you know, we have tools that make this trivial. Like it's, it's actually, you know, there's a million social media ways to increase our connectedness across the board. Why can't we use the same technology that's been around for everything else that we use to actually engage with cancer patients and directly partner with them in this kind of research? Um, the good news is, is that, you know, we have some evidence that this is a really good idea. The metastatic, I'd like to say the metastatic prostate cancer project is the first, we're number one and so on, but it's not about that one. And two, um, we're not the first. Um, our team, uh, led by my friends and colleagues, Corey Painter and Nikhil Wagle, uh, already launched something a couple of years ago in metastatic breast cancer. Uh, it's called the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. It's sort of, you know, our, our branding maybe isn't the most creative, but that's okay. Um, it's mbcproject.org. Um, here's the front page of the website. The idea was very simple. Um, rather than try to expect patients to come to you at your institution, bring the research projects to them, design the research projects from day one with patient input in mind, everything down to what is the right picture that should go in the silhouette of the front page? What is the language that should actually be on? What's the text that needs to be here to actually resonate with people and make it understand how meaningful it is? Um, every single detail was made with patients. And um, this was how it worked. Um, you basically go online, you tell, you ask it, answer a few simple questions, you provide informed consent. We walk you through what it means to give us permission to collect some of your samples. We send saliva kits to your door and you spit in the kit. We access your tumors, we do genome sequencing and we all learn together. Um, so this project's been open for about, let's say two and a half years now. And here's actually probably only because it was accessed maybe a month ago, which means it's already woefully out of date. Um, over 4,000 women and men with metastatic breast cancer in all 50 states have joined this project since, our, since launching it. Um, here's a map of where everyone's coming from. Here's where they're all, all the patients who've participated. Um, and as you can see already, just by eyeballing this map, these patients are not all coming from you know, Dana-Farber, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Stanford, uh, and two or three other institutions. They're coming from everywhere. Um, the other cool thing is that, you know, they're talking about their disease, and that's sort of a somewhat more prominent thing in, in breast cancer than it is in prostate cancer. We'll come back to that in a bit, but what's, what was kind of neat was, you know, we didn't expect this. Patients were telling other patients about this project, taking selfies with their saliva kits and, and describing what it meant for them to participate. Uh, it's, you know, it's almost like sort of giving them a chance to provide a voice that they didn't have before. You know, I want to live and watch my children grow up, but if I can't, then I want to leave a legacy and a cure. Um, as someone who does not live near a research center and therefore cannot easily participate in trials, I feel like I can contribute. And by the way, we're on slide 18. Um, the last one's giving us hope for the future, and if not for some of us, for our families. Um, here were voices that were there all along, but we weren't giving them an opportunity to participate. And so we couldn't provide that voice. So on slide 19, I'm actually showing you sort of the downstream product because we mean what we say when this is a patient driven project. And one of the first things patients said, and which is the same thing that Joe Biden said when he yell basically yelled at all of us in the cancer research field a year ago when he came to our meeting, which is you guys are slow, you don't share data, and patients don't like this, and they're right. So what we've done for that project, it's a little bit more mature, obviously, is the first 100 cancer genomes and all the according, uh, corresponding information we made available to anyone who wants to use it, any researcher, any scientist, any clinician, any patient, 
anyone can go to this cbioportal.org, can find the MBC project study cohort, can click on it, and can start to explore all the genetic information for these first 100 patients. It's there for anyone to use in sort of what we'd say, almost use some business speak, a pre-competitive space. We're not here, to, we're here to just make this available, so hoping that somebody who, somebody in the universe will find this helpful and that that will more rapidly accelerate discoveries for that disease. So all of that in slide 20 is really a segue to push forward with what we'd like to do here, which is the metastatic prostate cancer project. Um, so our big picture objective here is to generate a publicly available database of clinical genomic and patient reported data in metastatic prostate cancer to accelerate discoveries and new treatments. Um, how did we start this project? Well, on slide 22, we show we started it exactly like we said we would, which is we started talking to patients. Um, and we had the patients tell us exactly what, what, we, what they think was going to be needed for this kind of project, expecting that what worked in breast cancer surely wasn't going to work here because this is a different patients. You know, these are metastatic prostate cancer is a really complicated thing. There's a lot of different kinds. There's a lot of different flavors. It's not so straightforward. Um, a lot of different communities that talk about this disease that don't talk to each other. A lot of patients just simply don't talk about prostate cancer in any form openly under any forum. And we were hearing this from the men who were participating in our in our in our sort of prostate cancer working group and patient advocates. So not just men, but wives and daughters. Uh, in some cases of men who died of prostate cancer are telling us the same thing. So here's a couple of examples from one of our working group meetings from about a year ago. Um, and then it's actually Bryce Olson, who's, uh, who I'll come back to in a little bit, um, who's sort of a, a more social media savvy individual who's been talking about this and living with stage four cancer. Uh, so here's actually the, the background on slide 23, the metastatic prostate cancer project as it currently exists. This is the URL. You can go to mpcproject.org. Um, you know, to, to the point that I mentioned earlier about this is a patient-driven project, um, you'll notice on the silhouette here in the back uh, was not the first version of what we made. Um, and in fact, the first version that we made was basically silhouettes of a bunch of men who all looked about six foot two and looked like they were in really good shape. Um, and, and one after another, the 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 advocates and the patients who were, we were showing this to said, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> that doesn't resonate with me. That's not going to resonate with my husband. That's not going to resonate with my, my father. Um, we got to make people that look like other people. Um, and it, and it, that may seem like a trivial detail, but it's that kind of attention that we were trying to provide here because it really matters. This has to speak to patients. And the only way that can happen is if it's coming from other patients. Um, so how does this project work? Uh, I'm going to walk through some of the details of it here for this community. Um, it's on slide 24. So again, the, the big picture overview is that step one, tell us about yourself. You click the count me in button um, and um, they'll ask you some, some pretty simple questions. I'll show you some examples of them about your prostate cancer. Um, Step two is you provide informed consent. Um, we walk through uh, some of the, the details of that, that process uh, and what it means to actually share your data for research. And step three is that we learn along the way. And I think this is a key point here that I'll, actually, I'll come back to a few times because you know, what this project is, is a research project. At the moment, what this project is not is a mechanism to provide individualized results back to a patient because for, for numerous reasons, but those include, one, we're not a clinical lab. Uh, we don't have the capacity to actually provide that kind of information, but that's actually something we're working towards, which isn't to say if you participate in this project, you don't get anything in return, because what we do afford is a mechanism to share aggregate data. So basically, as like like we showed in the metastatic breast cancer example, one, the aggregate data gets presented in a de-identified form, meaning nobody can trace it back to you individually, but it's all there in an anonymized form such that you know anyone can learn from it. But more important than that is we actually provide updates as we learn, as we make new discoveries, we provide those updates to the community and those updates are, can be brought to a physician. Um, and you can ask with some simple questions like, 
do this for me? Or how does this, what does this mean for me? Um, and in that way, we really sort of believe and are, are hold firm this notion that learn, a lot, learn with us along the way is what really matters. Um, so what's the consent process like? Uh, this is sort of a quick screenshot of part of the consent form. Um, basically, we ask you to read through the entire thing, provide a phone number and an email address if there are any questions. Uh, Mike Dunphy, who's also on the line with me uh, this evening, uh, is, is the most uh, beats, is the most rapid responder to emails I've ever seen. Uh, sort of, it's, been, it's been quite impressive. <laughs> I, I must say I'm jealous of his ability to multitask and do that. Um, so the key points page really walks through some of the big picture notions of the consent. What does it mean to, to participate in a research? Um, again, every single word in this, in this consent process has been sort of vetted, looked at, reviewed, questioned by patients. So our hope is, is that this actually sort of is, is approachable. Um, and then walk through a full form, you can sign the consent online. Um, during, during this process, we actually ask patients a, a, a very simple questionnaire um, to get a little bit more information about your prostate cancer. This is on slide 26. Um, so this can include some pretty basic things. So simple about you. When were you first diagnosed with prostate cancer? If you don't remember, you can just enter the year. Um, when were you first diagnosed with advanced or metastatic prostate cancer? And again, um, prostate cancer that is spread beyond the prostate. And in this definition, we include what's called biochemical recurrence. So that's PSA that is you know, detectable, but no evidence of disease on scans. Um, and of course, for every question, there's the I don't know answer. So don't feel pressured like you have to actually know the details of, of any of this. Uh, if you don't know it, that's okay. Um, we asked some other kinds of questions. Um, what kind of therapies have you had? Part of the reason for that is because sometimes patients will respond somewhat surprisingly to us um, in terms of like, Either they receive some therapies we don't normally give to prostate cancer, like the ones here, but that can actually prompt new ideas and new questions, um, and also give a chance to sort of list any other treatments you've you've had for your disease, um, because you know it's really sort of an impossible question to ask in sort of our traditional framework, but could very easily be asked um, with patient reported data like this. Um, we asked some other kinds of questions. Have you had any other types of cancer? Do you have a family history of prostate cancer? How did you find out about this project? And the most important one, I think, and the one that's yielded the most interesting um, uh, discussion is, is there anything else you'd like us to know about your prostate cancer? Um, this is, you know, free text, write whatever you want. And um, you know, provide to provide your voice because that actually actually can prompt new ideas and new questions that we would have never thought of. Um, so, what does it mean when after you click all those buttons? The next thing that will happen is you'll get an email, um, and you'll eventually get in the mail a kit, and it will start as a saliva kit. And this is actually another important point that I would like to pause and sort of like acknowledge that this is a patient-driven project. Um, so the saliva kit comes in a, in a you know pretty boring looking box, uh, and inside that kit there's all the instructions you need on how to provide some saliva for for genetic testing. And you know again this isn't the first our first go around with doing a direct to patient project. We had the metastatic breast cancer project which I already described, um, and the second project was actually the angiosarcoma project which is a rare cancer, of extraordinarily rare cancer. Um, and here is the screenshots of the what the box looks like, the sort of like the label that goes on the box for the breast cancer one and the angiosarcoma one. And the first version of the one we made for metastatic prostate cancer looked identical. And it actually said up on the top left corner, metastatic breast prostate cancer project. We're showing that around to some of our patients, patient advocates, and we almost made a very big mistake because a lot of guys don't want people knowing that they or like the mailman or their neighbors or perhaps family members that they have prostate cancer. And we almost completely shot our project in the foot before we even got started simply because we as not patients would have never recognized how important that small detail was to to actually not have the label on the, on the surface of the box. Um, and we've actually already received feedback from patients who have asked about this, uh, which is sort of reassuring that we, we, we did the right thing and we, tr again, truly made this a patient-driven project. Again, this may seem like a strangely small detailed point, but it really matters and we, because it really sort of affirms for us the belief of how, of how important it is for these to be patient-driven projects. These are not driven by us. This is what patients are telling us how to, how to do it, basically. Um, 
Okay, so on slide 30, for now, how, what have we done so far with this effort? Um, well, we launched this project in January of this year. So we're at about, you know, let's see, sort of mid-January. So let's say we're at three months. Um, in three months, over 375 men with metastatic prostate cancer have joined the MPC project. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there and actually go back to what I said of Nick maybe 10, 15 minutes ago. If you recall, through a traditional approach that yielded some, some, some of the most important insights about metastatic prostate cancer of this decade, it took us four years to get 150 men. And here in three months, over 375 men have signed up. And we've already, and, and not just signed up, as you'll see in a bit, you know, some, sent saliva kits, received saliva kits, accessed tumor samples, and started to actually do genome profiling. And this isn't men sort of in one of, you know, let's say four or five, you know, center, uh, quaternary care, big academic medical cancer institutes. This is men from everywhere, um, across the United States, um, a little bit in Canada. We haven't hit all 50 states, as you'll, you'll notice here. Alaska is still missing from from a uh, from, from this map because we haven't we haven't yet uh, cracked that cracked Alaska yet. But uh, we're trying. Um, but I, again, mean to say that we, we really just started here, and it's taken off like gangbusters in a disease where guys don't like to talk about their disease. And this is actually the other sort of like uh, interesting thing that we're seeing. Um, you know, here's the metastatic breast cancer project. Here's the, the same quotes. Um, the kind of quotes we're getting from guys is maybe, maybe, maybe in retrospect predictable, but it's actually kind of charming in its own way. Um, <laughs> a little bit more blunt, a little bit more direct, um, but but also just equally sort of honest and inspiring in its own way. Um, my doctor told me to do this, which you know, um, uh, which is great, and I think it sort of speaks to sort of you know, how. What works and works to to with to partner with patients in one cancer doesn't necessarily translate to another, but both are equally important. So in slide 33, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to risk making my computer explode and, and actually launching this because I have a feeling it's not going to work. Uh, just knowing my my current like you know, uh, just like just the way these things go. But um, I would actually invite you guys to check out um, Bryce's Twitter. Uh, Twitter handle if you if you happen to be on Twitter. Um, he actually, so he's again one of the members of our, our patient advisory council. This is on slide 33. He he's one of the first people to receive a saliva kit. It was his birthday uh, right after we launched. This is again January 12th of 2018. And he actually made this cool video of basically, you know, uh, spitting in the kit and then skating down to the edge of the block and throwing the kit into the mail. And it's as simple as that. Um, it's been really fun to sort of see how different folks are taking this in different creative ways and how they think about this kind of project and what it means to them to be able to participate because they can see sort of how it affects them, how it could affect their family, the sort of the future, like the, the, the brothers, their, their sons, even the daughters, everyone who may actually be affected by this disease. Um, in doing this, we partner with individual patients and we partner with advocacy groups that are really sort of at every level sort of driving this you know patient driven research agenda forward including of course answer cancer us too along with other friends in this space and of course we're obviously interested in doing cast as wide of, of a of an advocacy umbrella as we can because you know that's what the patients want they want everyone to get under one tent and do this all together in concert as fast as possible because that can be more discoveries for them um, on slide 35, I'm actually showing you something that's, a, a, it's a, not, that's not the saliva kit, but it's actually equally important. Um, so what you're seeing here is what a so-called liquid biopsy kit looks like. So this is the other thing that we send to folks in the mail. Unlike breast cancer and other cancers, most men with metastatic prostate cancer will not have had a biopsy, meaning you know, a needle stuck somewhere, of their metastatic tumor because it's really hard. Most men have metastases to the bone. It's really hard to stick a needle there. It hurts really bad. And understandably, if a guy already has prostate cancer, they don't want to go through an unnecessary procedure. We recognize that. Um, so one of the cool new technologies, the new ways we're going working around that is actually using what's called a liquid biopsy. And the way this works is, is that we can actually, in, in many men, detect tumor DNA, so DNA from the tumor that's shed into the bloodstream, 
and in so doing, skip the need to stick a big needle into somebody's bone, still generate the same data we need for research. Um, and, the, and the way this works practically, and so far we've had almost no resistance, um, but I'll come back to that in a moment, is we mail one of these things, and when you come, you go for your next PSA draw, you know, we've had the guys just hands, hey, do you mind just filling, this, filling up one extra tube for me? They fill up the tube, put it in, the, put it in this packaging, put it in the mail, and it comes back to us. Um, in some cases, it's not that simple, and we've actually, we, we had a, with one slight bump in the road, we now have um, the ability to actually generate um, waivers for Quest uh, and actually have them as, as one of the lab options provide an ability for folks who don't have any other access to actually provide this blood sample. And we're also all you know finalizing terms for a few other um, blood vendors, so to speak. So labs that actually can get this stuff for us to make this as easy of a process as possible. Still relatively early days on this, but again, we're pretty excited in the results so far. Um, because you know we can actually show you some results. So this is slide 36. I'm assuming most folks have not uh, had the chance to look at a cancer genome before. Um, I had not until I was a, a <laughs> in my in, in my fellowship for oncology. So just I'll walk you through one of these things. So this is um, each each thing uh, down here is a is a chromosome. So everyone's got 22 of them. There's an X chromosome and there's a Y chromosome that got cut, cut off from this figure. I apologize for that. And that that is what makes you you. Um, in in normal tissue, so in not cancer, um, this should basically be, oops, there it is, one straight line all the way across because everyone should have just simply, you know, a normalized number of, of copies of each chromosome in every cell in their body. In cancer, it doesn't work that way. These chromosomes get shattered. Every one of them almost can get shattered and, and can, there can be gains, there can be losses. And all of this is actually part of the computational challenge that sort of is, faces folks like me. But it's just to say here that you can, you can see that this, this is clearly not hugging a line. There's lots of genetic changes that are either going up or down. Um, and this is not a normal set of DNA. What you should also know is that we generate this information from a liquid biopsy that came in the mail. Um, as simple as that, uh, and, and actually as proof of principle demonstrated the power of this approach um, when we can't actually find tumor DNA to, to do studies on. Um, for this project, for the first you know, subset of men that we have this information on, we can actually use the information that's gathered from those sur survey questions that I showed you um, to help us actually inspire new questions. Um, so here's the patient reported data. So this is just fresh data from the project as it's ongoing. Um, on the left is a pie chart of metastatic prostate cancer patients who've who are participating in our project and whether they have other cancers. And you'll notice that for some reason, there's a sort of a slightly larger um, pie, pie slice, so to speak, of, of men with pr metastatic prostate cancer who also have melanoma, a skin cancer, the skin cancer I talked to you about in the beginning. Um, for years, we've known that there's some unclear clinical relationship between those two diseases. We have no idea what that is. And now, all of a sudden, here we've simply just by asking patients who have the simple question, we can n zoom in on those patients over time and try to figure out what are the genetic changes that are shared between these tumors? What, what does that all mean? On the right-hand side, um, there's men who, whether they had a prostatectomy or not, and whether that mattered, um, whether, in essence, whether they had their prostate removed. Again, you can ask a simple question, those who did, those who didn't, and then see what we learned in terms of the genetics. Um, on the left here is more patient reported data. Uh, men who have family members who have either breast or, uh, prostate or breast cancer, knowing those two diseases are genetically related. We can learn all sorts of information by zooming in on those patients and studying both their tumor DNA and their DNA that they were born with. And on the right, uh, you know, men who were diagnosed with, so with metastatic prostate cancer as their first diagnosis. So men who showed up in the, in the clinic with metastatic disease at first, you know, at first glance, it wasn't that they had surgery and then something happened. Um, that's probably a different kind of disease than the, than the other folks, but we don't really understand what that means. And all of these are new questions. These are new hypotheses that we can actually now start to zoom in on, not by going after all the medical record data and all the pain of that 
entails, but simply by asking the patients directly some very simple questions and then going into the genetics as we generate it. And in essence, this is new science that's driven by patients and the, and the questions and the answers patients are providing. Um, so what do we want to do with this? What we'd like to do, and I said from the beginning, is we want to translate these discoveries into clinical action. You know, we can't return individualized results, but how quickly can we turn results in aggregate into something that can actually make an impact on any patient with metastatic prostate cancer? Um, because and this is actually a screenshot from the consent. We're very transparent with what we can and cannot do. Um, with the information we collect will aid in our research efforts to better provide to, to provide better treatment and prevention options. And we provide updates about key research discoveries made possible by your participation. So this is a screenshot from the consent form. Um, what does that mean? So I talked about this BRCA observation that we made in 2015. One year later, we actually made a follow, had a follow-up study that I was lucky to participate in um, where we found a whole lot of these things, these events, in a large swath of men with metastatic prostate cancer, not in their tumors, but rather in the DNA that they were born with. Um, and then by 2017, like I said, we have all these clinical trials. We have universal genetic testing, which is now an, an NCCN guideline, um, and presumably, hopefully very soon, if not already, will be covered by insurance. Um, and these are the kinds of regular updates and research findings that we can provide to the participants in real time um, that you can just bring to your doc. Uh, it's as simple as that. And because this, uh, this field is moving so fast and the discoveries are happening so quickly uh, that, you know, it's hard for doctors to keep up with all of this across all diseases. But that's where we can actually sort of create that bridge and make a more engaged and informed patient, which can help everyone. So to summarize on slide 42, um, partnering directly with MDM, the metastatic prostate cancer community, we think will enable rapid identification of large numbers of patients who are willing to share their tumor, saliva, and medical records to accelerate research and discoveries that may impact them, that may impact their families. Um, this helps us study rare patients and other, other kinds of patients that we've never historically been able to, to study using the, the, the regular approaches. And it creates this shared resource that we think, you know, we're not trying to create, the last thing on earth we're trying to do is create another data silo, another way to sort of like create a little fiefdom uh, that we can, you know, this stuff, this stuff is made for everyone. This isn't, we're, this is for everyone to use and whomever uses it to make it, make a discovery, more power to them. What we're here for is for the patients. Um, so here's our team. There's me. Uh, there's, uh, I look, again, even in that picture, I look more well-rested than I do when I'm on my webcam right now. That's okay. Um, I mentioned Corey and Nick, uh, Stephanie and Mike. Mike's actually on the call tonight. Um, there's actually, this is embarrassingly slightly out of date. There's probably at least four other people that should be on this slide. That's my fault. Um, you know, we're all, we're all trying to do this um, really at, at your service in, in essence. And, and, and we mean that sincerely. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. I, kinda, I think I went on for about the right time, hopefully. Uh, I'll, I'll pause if there's any questions, um, but quickly, here's the, our, our general email address if you have any questions for us, um, our Twitter handle, our Facebook page. Um, we probably have 20 other ways you can find us if need be, uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're really excited. And again, actually, maybe we'll say one more time, thank you to Rick and Chuck, to Answer Cancer, to us two, um, to all the patients, advocates, family members, friends, whomever are on this call right now who sort of chose to listen to this rather than watch the NCCA, NCAA tournament. Um, <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you again for your attention. Wow, Ellie, that, that was phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. And I have a feeling a lot of other people have too. Right. And uh, Jake, um, we, we got to like these guys from our... Uh, Facebook page, right? So yes, sir. Uh, okay, thank you. I think we can do that. Okay, <laughs> Jake's our social media oh, great. Co coordinator. Um, so I have um, I have a bunch of questions, but before I go to and, and most of these questions, all but one, um, have been sent to me um, or they've been posted in our um, uh, in our, in the in the chat window. Um, but before I do that, I want to introduce um, a quite prestigious panel that we have with us today. 
and in fact one person in particular who to some extent may even have benefited already. So I'm going to start with, with Professor Bill Burhans um, and just give a quick introduction to him. I'll introduce the other two people and then um, I'll let them ask their questions. Um, Bill is a, is a cancer research professor at Roswell Park who has spent quite a lot of his um, career looking at um, issues around the BRCA gene and uh, PARP inhibitors and, and then discovered that he was BRCA positive himself um, and um, has benefited from taking a lab rib. So, so he has a, a very direct interest in um, in, in what we're talking about here. Uh, and he's a good example as to how somebody can benefit from, um, from the genetic analysis. Um, then we welcome Len Sierra, who is a retired um, research pharmacologist, who also, as it happens, um, is BRCA positive. So, um, you know, another person um, whose uh, genetic analysis uh, will probably at some point come into play. Fortunately, um, Lens disease is being well managed right now um, without using a PARP inhibitor. But if it, if it gets to that point, then um, PARP inhibitor is available. And then lastly, uh, Jake Hannum, um, who uh, is our social media coordinator. And, and I want to say the reason we have these three guys on here is because they've all already participated. So anybody right. that's listening who wants to ask or get a first-hand um, experience of how easy it is to, do, to participate or what the issues are around participating, send us a, send, feel free to send us a, a, a question for the panel. Um, so let's kick off with you, uh, Bill. Um, what, um, what questions have been raised in your mind for Ellie from this presentation? So Ellie, I enjoyed your presentation tremendously. Um, and I'm really happy that you guys are doing this. I think it's going to have a big impact. Um, I made a long list of questions, but you answered many of them in the right. course of your talk. <laughs> the top of my list was, um, you know, the, the, the as you indicated, there's a uh, there's a much larger uh, frequency with which African Americans develop prostate cancer and they die at about two times the frequency of Caucasians. And so, what are you guys doing to <laughs> make sure that that particular issue is being addressed? So that's, that's a great question, and I think it speaks to one of the areas that has been sort of, a, a, frankly, an embarrassing weakness in the, in the studies that we've done so far, which is we've now aggregated lots of data on, on both local and advanced prostate cancer. Um, the vast majority of the men that we've studied um, ha, you know, are, are Caucasian. And part of the reason for that is, is if you look at, you know, that, that same slide of like the, the, our, our dream team project and you look at what those medical institutions are, you know, they're in predominantly Caucasian patient populations. And the you know, we're just not going to where the people are that we can actually ask these questions. In. And it's as simple as that. And, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to address that. Um, one of the ways we actually try to take this head on both for this project and also for the metastatic breast cancer project is make sure that there's those voice, you know, voices of, you know, sort of underrepresented communities are, are at the forefront of, of what we're doing. Um, so for our project, multiple members of our patient advisory council are, are African-American, you know, including one uh, patient advocate whose husband passed away from pro metastatic prostate cancer, another patient advocate um, in Texas. And, um, you know, and basically just shut up and listen. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Uh, whatever we've been doing, it's been wrong, uh, and so we're trying to f figure out how to make it how to make it right. Because you're right, that's one of the biggest open questions in this field, um, and frankly, we don't know. Uh, I was lucky. I was part. I was part of a scientific team that looked at the first 100 um, genomes of of African American men with local prostate cancer, so not even metastatic disease. And we actually were able to use that to make an interesting observation um, 
simply by just you know picking a, a, a patient population that doesn't historically get studied, but still was, it was maybe a hundred men in total. We didn't really answer the question you asked by any means, um, and we get a long way to go. Um, so, so part of the reason we're here is, is actually we're trying to, frankly, engage with everyone, um, and, and especially those that, that are typically underrepresented. Um, that would be, that would be a, a remarkable outcome. Um, that that would be that would be amazing to actually achieve, and that we're working we're working towards it, but we're not there yet. I'll be perfectly honest. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my next question is: um, Do you anticipate? So as you know, some of the drugs that uh, we're taking uh, that we're being treated with are extraordinarily expensive. Yeah. Do you expect that this project is going to potentially reduce some of the costs of these drugs? Is that that's a good question. I think it would be very um, it would be very bold to say that this project will itself directly do that. Um, the The drug pricing world is a very complicated one that's way above my my personal pay grade. I'll be perfectly honest on that on that point as well. Um, you could imagine though that it, these discoveries over time could it, it you know could reveal sort of genetically defined or molecularly defined patient cohorts so like men who have specific mutations who may actually be the ones who benefit from drug x y or z and having that more refined ability to sort of pick which patients should match to which drugs could then sort of optimize the use of those drugs and that could over time actually reduce the cost um i could probably talk myself out of that pretty quickly because <laughs> uh, the the world of drug pricing is, is just extraordinarily complicated and way beyond uh, what we're trying to do here <laughs> with our humble yeah. little, uh, patient-driven project, but um, you know, yeah, I'm aware of those yeah. topics. <laughs> uh, but that would be a that would be a, a remarkable, albeit unexpected, outcome. Yeah, Bill. Okay, we'll maybe uh, I'll... we'll we'll try to come back to you. Let me um let let me bring in a couple of questions each from from um uh, from Len and from Jake. Len, please. Uh, Please go ahead. Okay, thanks, Rick. Uh, Ellie, I, I'd like to echo Rick's comments about your presentation. Phenomenal. Thank I you. wish I was there to give you a big bear hug. Thank <laughs> you for doing this. Well, next okay. time you're Boston. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first question, um, liquid biopsies. I don't recall the, <clears throat> excuse me, the details, but there was a recent publication that showed that uh, liquid biopsies, uh, replication of the analyses were not particularly good. Yes. Is that a concern for you? Definitely, and I think we're very aware of, of those issues with the results. And that's actually, you know, when we say, you know, we can be, patients very understandably say, why aren't you giving us our individual results back as a clinical test? To be perfectly honest, part of the answer is, is is studies like what you just described, because from our perspective, a lot of this is still research. I, I think we, frankly, still have a lot to learn about what that what those kinds of results mean. So, for those who don't know, what you're referring to is you now so there's been a couple of studies where um, doctors have sent either the identical sample or, in some cases, a, a biopsy or a blood sample to different companies, and then received clinical tests back that have so oftentimes troublingly little overlap, if any overlap at all, of the actual stuff in the report. And I think that speaks to how this is still all research. There are both bi biological and tactical potential explanations for that. Um, tumors can be very, you know, heterogeneous. They can, they can be, within one tumor, there can be a lot of different subtypes of tumor. It's a really complicated thing. So it's also entirely possible that you could sample, you could do genetics on a tumor biopsy and genetics on the blood and see different results. Conversely, you can also see that simply because um, one test isn't as refined as another or there's still work to do. And, and that's part of the stuff we're trying to ask. So for this project, whenever possible, we get both the blood sample and we get a, a tumor sample that's sort of from discarded tissue from the, that's left over and actually do sequencing on both of those samples to try to compare and make sure that we're doing it correctly. Um, but we recognize that like that's, you know, the, there, 
that's why we're doing that's why we're calling it research because we just we're still trying to understand how all this whole how this entire puzzle goes together okay uh next question is kind of a a, a two-part question that are linked um do you have a specific number of patients uh, some critical mass that you nope. feel is necessary no okay uh, more 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 we, more is better we, we are not we are not restricted by sample size good uh, should we all be talking to our own medical oncologists about this project and encouraging them to encourage their patients to participate, or are you guys doing that? So we're, we, you know, we we have to be very careful that we're not like sort of being because some some doctors can be sensitive about these things, and we what we don't want to do is make it look like we are intruding within the very sacred patient doctor relationship. Very respectful of that. I can completely sympathize. Um, you know, and it's not so. Basically, it's not up to us. So we're we're actually we're not doing a, a very aggressive amount, I would say, of of di doctor directed sort of um, uh, reach out and for, for that reason because we don't want to make you know, we we can't we just don't want to put that pressure there. Patients, on the other hand, can do whatever they want. Um, and and so long as you guys are interested and want to talk to your docs about this, it's 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 you know. Once doctors find out they don't have to do anything, <laughs> they don't have to fill out any extra forms, they don't have to like click any extra buttons or do any of the stuff that drives some of our job, some people in our job nuts, um, they actually tend to be quite supportive. Um, we've had actually some cases where doctors have gotten been so enthusiastic, they've actually helped to make it easier to share this information with patients um, on their own, which completely unprompted from us, which sort of speaks to the potential way it can resonate. But again, this really, this comes from patients. So I think... Um, you know, so long as it starts there, that that that's from our perspective. That that's the difference. That's what we're doing. That's different than everything else. Okay, Rick. If I can just ask one more, um, I'd like to know if now or in the future will your database be open to all uh, prostate cancer research scientists? Yes. So as soon okay. as we as well, we don't. So right now we have two small of numbers like. That of actually the data, all the data that we need is basically complete. Like in the, we just, it, it would be identify. We, we couldn't just put it out there because then probably the, the risk is too high that somebody can just walk in there and point to themselves. Um, but as soon as we have a critical mass, you know, we're just going to release it. So, and we have, this is what I mentioned with the metastatic breast cancer project. You know, the typical benchmarks of, of, you know, of waiting until one gets enough data to publish a paper as sort of the landmark are not things that are like things that matter in academia, but don't don't matter in any way to patients. We're not waiting for those things. So that data, as soon as we have a critical mass um, or hit a certain timeline, and I think, and I, I know Mike's on the call and can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like on our whiteboard, we'd, we'd marked September 2018 as our sort of ballpark first data release, which we'll see if we hit. Um, but um we're just going to put it out there as soon as we can, because again, we don't want to be the bottleneck. We want to put it out there for the whole community. Any, anyone who can use it to make a discovery, you know, that's amazing. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. And Thanks. by the way, so just a proof of principle, I mean, y'all, if you'd like, you can go to the, that, that, what URL I put there, cbioportal.org. One of, you know, it's, it's not the, not the most patient friendly website in the world, but it's, it's all right. Um, and anyone can find the metastatic breast cancer project and start to play around with uh, the data. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not limited to sort of traditional prostate cancer researchers. Really, anyone who wants to take a swing at this can. You hear that? You hear that, Professor Bill? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go to Jake. Um, Jake, what, what questions do you have in mind? Uh, uh, like the others have said, uh, Dr. Van Allen, I enjoyed your presentation. It was very, very good, very interesting and informative. Um, Len and Bill stole all my questions pretty much, but they did it much more eloquently than I could have ever asked them. <laughs> um, but I do have a, a comment and, and, and one question or clarification. Uh, on, you mentioned tumor sample. Did you go, do you go to the doctor then and ask for that? Or? So, so the, the tumor sample is, is is findable from the medical records, and it lives usually in some pathology lab somewhere. Um, oftentimes, you know, affiliated with the hospital, somebody had their surgery at, or so on and so forth. And the first thing we review is to see what's there, um, because if there's not a lot there, we don't we don't even try, because we don't want to actually be in a situation where we've exhausted that sample, and now right. a patient might need it for a clinical trial, and we we have 
screwed that up. So we actually are very careful not to do that um, because that would be wrong. Um, but if there's enough sample, we it's a, it's actually a very straightforward process to make a request um, from the lab to, because you, you've provided the consent and given us permission to do that, um, to then track down that sample, bring it a little bit over, over to our lab to do genetic sequencing. Can I, let me just interrupt a second. Whoever just joined, can you mute? Hello. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Um, and that, that kind of leads to my next question. Um, I, I went on to your site the other day. I, I'm the one that contacted you on Rick's behalf and asked, asked you the number of slides and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, but, and I went on to your site the other day because, you know, I did submit a sputum sample and a blood sample back in January, I think. Okay. Um, and, I, and then I went to the site and it says, there we go again. Yeah, I don't, I can't see them on here to mute them. Yeah, it's a waiting for name again. Yeah. So if it, whoever just joined, please, please, can you be kind enough to mute? Hello? Let me try this. Okay, so what I'm now, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm just gonna unmute you, Jake, and I'll unmute people as I, as I call on them, and let me unmute Ellie. Uh, Sorry, uh, sorry for this, but where's Ellie gone? Okay, Ellie's unmuted. So go ahead, Jake. Okay. Um, so anyway, I went on your your website, and and there was an option I forget where where you can change or you can check your answers mm -hmm. and edit them or update them or whatever. Yeah. Because I wanted to make sure I gave you the right doctors' names and all that yep. kind of thing, because it's been a while. My memory's not that great. Um, and it recognized the system recognized me by my email. But then when it wouldn't let me, um, this is this is just a comment. It, it asked me for my password, and I couldn't remember the password. And then it said it sent me a. It said we'll it said we'll send you the password, but it never did. So hmm. I think there might I might be a glitch in your. Thank you for that. This is again, and it, you know, we like to think we're perfect, but obviously we're not. <laughs> so actually, that's actually very helpful feedback. Um, and um, you if you could just send send a separate email to that info at email, we'll. We'll figure it out. Info at uh, NPC project. Yeah, yeah, and, and okay. then just send us a note, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll we we actually have a growing set of of data science engineers who have built the entire front and back end of that website, um, who okay. hopefully will can can fix it. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that to our attention. That's a, sure. But please speak out from those kinds of issues. The sooner we, we don't want to sort of be a year into this and some you know and turn out there's a massive bug in the whole thing, <laughs> which we don't think there is. Obviously, we've beta tested this you know up the wazoo, but there's always things to fix. So a, a lot. Anyway, thank lines, you. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Along those lines, Ellie, um, one question I received is: um, if we have not yet received a liquid biopsy kit, who should we tell? Um, feel free to email the info at mpcproject.org. Um, either myself or Mike or one of the other me team members can look into it. Um, there are some reasons why we we may not have sent the kits. Um, we had to. What we sent out the first wave of kits, and then we had to sort of uh, say, without going into details, do a slight re renegotiation with our friends at Quest Labs in terms of getting that voucher. So we put a slight pause on sending out more kits until we had that squared away. Um, that should be resolved. Uh, and then, likewise, we um, uh, there are instances where the you know the, the if the patient's reported something that makes it not technically, you know, metastatic or advanced prostate cancer, um, we try to explain that whenever possible. But that could, that could, that's a possibility. But uh, I, I would suggest to have that person just email us, and we'll we'll, we'll dig into it. Okay. Um, as I recall, as I recall, uh, Ellie, uh, I got the sputum kit first, and then approximately yes. a month later, I got the blood sample kit to take to my doctor. Yep. Is that the way you're, yes. you're trying Most to? Yes. Most likely. Okay. Yep. So I have um, I have one question for my for myself, and then I have several questions that have been sent to me, um, most of which are pretty short. Um, the first question, my question, is I just want to delve a little more into how you're communicating pertinent result pertinent results to patients. So you, you mentioned I think that um, when you found that. Um, that the BRCA gene was an appropriate 
actionable gene that you got back to some of your guys and said, well, you have the BRCA gene um, to give them a heads up so that they could go talk to their own medical team. Can, can you just talk a little bit more about how, uh, what, what sort of information you're communicating back to the patient, what they might be able to expect? Right. So actually, and that's actually a really important point, and I apologize if I wasn't clear, but I think, so just to be crystal clear, we cannot report individual genetic results to a patient. So um, this is a, because it's a research study and because there are the questions like the ones that were you know, mentioned earlier about the, 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 the validity of the, of the test and so on and so forth. Because of that, mm-hmm. we're very careful not to do that because we don't want to mislead people because, again, we're doing a research project. We're not providing clinical care. So in your example, we would not actually only seek out the patients who have like BRCA mutations that we see in our research study, but rather provide to the entire community a, the, the discovery, ah, you know, summarized got it. and say, and, and, and suggest because as, as, and I use that, that's more of sort of an example of something that we've already found. So it doesn't really count because we actually, as just the best, it was the closest example I could find to what we'd like to do because right. we obviously were too soon into this project to actually have one. Right. Um, but, um, but what we'd like to do is, you can imagine in that scenario, if that was playing out in real time, provide that information to everyone, especially because the result there actually suggested that all men should get genetic testing who have metastatic prostate cancer um, like, uh, and, um, and disseminate that to the entire community. And, and that can actually be then be brought to a patient's physician's attention uh, and it can prompt uh, more studies. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm clear on that because that's actually a pretty important point. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions that ask about follow-up, whether you will be following these patients with additional genetic samples or updating the progress of their disease or not. So the short answer is yes. Um, obviously, this project's not mature enough for that to be really be in play, but we've already started working on for the metastatic breast cancer project, which is a couple of years old. Um, secondary surveys, follow-up surveys, mechanisms for patients to report more information or as time has gone by. Um, we're working through actually the ability to send out repeat kits to folks in the right situations. Again, this is all works in progress, but the short answer is yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, is the project available outside the U.S.? I saw you had some Canadian Response. Great question. Um, so our our inter- institutional review board has allowed us to work with Canada so far. Um, as we've learned in real time, every country's got its own very unique. Uh, be careful, what I say very unique set of rules about this kind of stuff, like samples, whether or even whether a sample can leave the country, for example. Um, so we're taking this one country at a time. Uh, so uh, right now. You know, Canada is is, is 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 possible, but other countries unfortunately are not. Uh, our hope is that over time we can overcome those complexities. Um, for for our, this is obviously pertains to every project we're doing in this in this space. Um, let's see. Um, is there a limit on biopsy samples that may be several years old? Uh, great question. So the it, most samples um, will probably, if they're accessible, they probably are, are, are okay for use. Um, there is a, sometimes instances where a sample is so old uh, that it, it doesn't, it can't be used for genetic testing, and and that's again. We kind of are expe- in this disease more than other diseases, expecting that to be perhaps more of a problem than that, you know, because of the nature of, of prostate cancer and how, how it works, where you'll have men who may have had, you know, a prostatectomy 15 years ago and then they develop metastatic cancer. And that's only confirmed by like a PSA or something like that. So, um, because of that, that's sort of yet another reason why we'd like to add on this liquid biopsy component to this project. But, uh, um, you know, I think that that's a good question. I think we'll find out over time. Uh, Fred is giving you a heads up that um, Dr. Tawari did a um, study on African Americans and maybe a good source for finding participation from African Americans. Oh yes, I know. The, I know the name. Um, I know. I know the uh, name. Sinon. 
Yes, absolutely. And there, there have been a few. Um, and I think, um, um, I don't actually, I'm still sharing my thing. Um, there have been a few uh, efforts like that, but I think what we, we still feel like we, you know, we haven't answered the question. I mean, fundamentally. So therefore we, we need to fit, we need to do more, do it in, with more expanded genomic analysis, do something to, to actually try to address the question that was raised earlier about, you know, African-American men in particular and, and, and advanced prostate cancer. But thank you for sharing that. I think we'll, we're, we're, we're going to jump on that. Um, there's a gentleman who thinks he's registered with stratify prostate. I, that doesn't mean anything to me. It may mean something to you, Ellie. Can he participate in both these genome studies? Yeah, absolutely. From our perspective, there's no question about it. We are we are a, a, a nonprofit, you know, research initiative funded by a bunch of bunch of computer nerds just trying to answer a question. <laughs> so it's fine with us. Um, now I have um I have a couple of questions here which are a little bit more general um, about genetic testing or genotyping for men with metastatic disease. Um, Somebody asks, uh, what genetic testing or genotyping should men with metastatic disease undergo to ascertain their likelihood of dying from their disease? And another person asks about the labs where this is available. Um, the lady who asked about the labs where this is available, if you join um, any one of our advanced cancer virtual support groups, we can give you a whole bunch of information. I, I don't want to put Ellie in a position where he's He's recommending commercial labs, yeah. um, but we can certainly help you. Or if you send me an email, I can I can talk to you about labs where you can do both germline testing for inherited genes and um, somatic testing uh, for samples. Um, but Ellie, do, do you want to just talk very briefly about the importance of, of, of understanding your your uh, your gene sequence when you have met metastatic disease. Yeah, so I th I think there's there's two reasons why it could be really important. Um, and so I thank you for not putting me in that situation to actually pick pick a company or two. Uh, yeah. it's, I don't want to get in that. It's not it's not for me to say. Um, but um, I'd say for the tumor side of things, you know, it, it gives you a chance to look at your cancer's tumor or your cancer's genetics rather, and you know, see whether there's anything that might actually be actionable in the moment um, or potentially actionable down the road. And that could have major impact for you. Um, so Bryce Olson, who is one of the, the men that's in the slide deck, um, sort of ha has a very specific mutation in a gene called PIK3CA. The name, again, not important. The drug class is. He got himself onto a clinical trial of one of those inhibitors. And he's, you know, I think three or four years of metastatic prostate cancer, no evidence of disease. Um, those are still the outlier stories. Those are exceptional cases. We don't have enough of those right now, but but the hope is, is that as we build these kinds of data sets and, and as this happens in real time, that's gonna become more of a reality. The germline genetic testing, so the testing of your inherited DNA, again, based off of some of the work that we did a couple of years ago, is really important because that, um, has impact not just for you because they're actually depending on if we find something there's potential therapeutic meaning to that that finding of certain kinds of events in in your germline genome could have immediate implications for the kind of drugs we'd want to give you in the clinic that are not usually what we give for prostate cancer so all the more reason to put it on the radar it could have imminent if i imminent importance for members of your family because by definition that kind of event could also be something in your sister's or your brothers, or your kids, or your grandkids. Um, and that's a very complicated thing to, to wrap your head around, but, but step one is sort of having that knowledge to then, if you want to proceed and actually understand it, to actually then go forward for more genetic counseling and sort of who else might get tested and so on and so forth. But the only way to get started is to start with yourself and see if with all the technology we have so far, do we see anything or not? We're going to go with just two more questions and then we're going to close out. I'm going to go back okay. to, to Bill um, because I felt like I shortchanged him a little bit. Bill, one last question for you. Okay. Uh, so very quickly, you you indicated that way that um, I think the word that you used in your slide deck was that uh, currently 
the data that you collect won't be available to the patients that participate, which seems to imply that perhaps at some point in the future, it will be available. Is that the case? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing not, but... The, sh the short answer is, is that we are, we are trying to figure out the, the pathway towards enabling return of results to individuals. We're not there yet, to be crystal clear. That's not something we can do right now. That's something we'd like to do. Um, it involves sort of overcoming a lot of the technical challenges with the tests, the regulatory challenges of who's actually responsible for delivering that information, the follow-up challenges to actually do it responsibly so we're not you know, sort of like providing data out of context that's meaningless that we're interrupting in, or inserting ourselves into clinical care. There's a lot of things we got to sort through, but we're actually, this, this year has actually been de this far and prospectively is really dedicated to trying to solve this because, you know, you're not alone. Um, that question is on the minds of I'm surely everyone who's participating in our project. It's on the minds of everyone participating in the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project, the Angiosarcoma Project. We all recognize that. Absent that, the driving, the motivator remains and has worked for them, has worked here, that, you know, there is power in, you know, sort of building towards the future. You know, that, that sort of that true band of brothers mentality. This may never benefit me, but it's going to benefit my brothers, my, my sons, my daughters, and the rest, and the future generations. And, and you know, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and, and, of course, when, as soon as we figure out a pathway towards returning results at scale, you know, we're going to do it um, because we, we're completely agree. It's, that's what we'd like to do. But we're just not quite there yet. Yeah. Okay. I I understand completely that you guys are uh, you're doing uh, research. You're not doing patient care, but it is something that I think um, uh, a, a large number of the patients that I encounter in the waiting rooms of the clinics that I go to um, are interested in that specific question. Totally. And they find out that I'm a cancer scientist. I I have I have a question along those lines. I don't. I don't remember um, even filling out my name on the sputum sample or the blood. Possibly the doctor did it on the blood, but I know I didn't do it on a sputum. So is there a, a unique identifying number? There's a I unique barcode on each on, on those on those um, uh, on those vials uh, okay. and on the kits. And so once you log in your information, you know, on the back end, everything can everything gets tracked so that we can figure out who's who. Um, okay. So there's actually, if you look very close, there's actually a little barcode on those things. It's just hard to see. Okay. Well, I don't have it in front of me anymore, but I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. And I thought there must be some unique identifier, but I wasn't yeah. sure. So for future use, if you yeah. ever get around to, right. to uh, sending out individual results. <laughs> oh yeah. <right. laughs> um, so the last question I want to ask you is a good one. Um, it addresses the fact that immunotherapies have not, and, and, some of, and some of the precision medicine uh, protocols have not been very effective for prostate cancer. Right. And um, the, uh, this person asks why you think that might have been, and is, um, is there anything special about prostate cancer, or what is it that's special about prostate cancer that makes it somewhat resistant? And I've added to this, how has, this or might this have impacted on your uh, MPCP planning? So the short answers are, that's a great question. Nobody who in our field, frankly, has any idea. Um, but what we do know is that, you know, there, there is a subset of men with advanced prostate cancer who have a very specific genetic defect called microsatellite instability. Those men are more likely to respond to immunotherapies. In prostate cancer, there's only about three to five percent of men respond. Um, oh, sorry, only three to five percent of men have that specific genetic defect. We also know, and uh, emerging data is sort of indicating that those cancer immunotherapy response rates in prostate cancer are higher than three percent, or somewhere between ten and twenty percent, depending on who you believe. Which means. Therefore, there has to be some kind of explanation, one, for why those other guys respond. That has nothing to do with what I just said. We don't know what that is. And our hope is, is that can actually give us a clue as to why the rest of folks don't, because we don't know. Um, 
you know, in fact, it's interesting in the first, let's say maybe 150 guys who signed up for the project, about seven or eight men noted because that we, I think I even showed the, 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 the picture uh, of the questionnaire that they had received one of these new immunotherapies. And um, it seemed like most of them had actually received it off label, which we know is happening in the community. Um, and that's not something that one can traditionally study in sort of a traditional way, but it's happening probably at, commonly in the real world. And maybe this is a way to actually answer that question more effectively. Um, the, I say this as somebody, so much of my re research program is actually tr uh, trying to figure out the genomics of why certain patients across cancers do or don't respond to cancer immunotherapies. And we've done a lot of work and found made a lot of cool observations in other cancers. Uh, prostate cancer is just, we don't know. Um, and we, we'd like to, we'd like to, this, this could be a mechanism to help us answer, but, but the honest answer is we don't know. Thank you. As well, as me, as everyone else. <laughs> So, Rick, can I ask one more question? One more question, because it's you, Bill, because we love you so much. It's directly related to that. So I'm one of the guys that now, uh, I, I have been treated with Olaparib for the last three years, and it right. fine until recently, but I'm now resistant, and Sorry. I'm now to Keytruda. Okay. Uh, and so uh, I don't yet know whether or not I have microsatellite instability that's you know, we're going to look at that as soon as possible. But is it possible that uh, the response that some patients have is just simply related to overall mutational burden, not yes. just, you know, mutations that result in microsatellite instability? Yes. It is. Okay. Absolutely. And I can shamelessly point to some of the work that I've done in melanoma <laughs> that shows that. Um, if I were, if this were an academic conference, I would shamelessly promote myself and the, and the random scientific papers that I published that <laughs> describe all that. Um, but the better answer is, is absolutely, I guess I just did that. Um, <laughs> the better answer is yes, absolutely. And like I said, you know, it's not really even just true across the cancer, it's really true across the board. We don't really understand the, the nitty gritty as to why certain patients do or do not benefit from these drugs not just in prostate cancer, but even in other diseases, lung cancer, melanoma, and so on and so forth. Um, certainly there is enrichment for responders for microsatellite instability, but that's by no means 100%. Um, not even close, it's actually like 40%. So the royal we have a long way to go. We can try to answer that question the old fashioned way and hopefully a decade from now we'll have an answer, or we can try to answer it this way. Um, and we're sort of, we're thinking this might be a more compelling way forward. Yeah, I I agree. So I signed up. I'm Great, thank you. So um, so Ellie, if you remember afterwards, if you can send me the links to your shameless paper, I will forward <laughs> them to Bill because yes. probably about the only person on this call who's going to be able to understand and follow <laughs> exactly what it is. And I have a feeling Bill would be very interested in in reading the paper. Is that right, Bill? But yes, actually, I have uh, written down in my notes here to contact you afterwards and right. ask you about the paper. This is the one that you just published online six hours ago, that one uh, too. That one too, yes, that was different. Oh, now I really get to shamelessly promote all the papers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. well, um, look, we've, we've, we've gone a little bit over, but not too much. And I know there's a lot of people, I know this but um, at around 9.20, we had a sudden loss of people when the Villanova, <laughs> when the Villanova Michigan game started. Um, Chuck Strand, is there anything that you would like to close out with before we finish the meeting? I just would like to come back to us too. Go, oh, you may have gone. Okay, well, I- Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. No, we're here, go ahead, yeah. please. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, I, I muted my line, but um, I just want to say thanks so much because it's just really exciting to know that this project's out there and it's refreshing to know that the uh, the model is, is flipped in terms of really focusing on the uh, aggregate uh, results of the patient population. It's, uh, it's, it's I, I appreciate being part of the project, so thank you. I'll say again, thank you guys. Um, everyone on this call, Rick, Chuck, the whole all the great questions all the you know it's good to see people's faces engaged and interested you know this this project really it only is going to work if, if patients take the lead um and i mean that you know me talking about it 
fine. You guys talking about it actually carries weight um, and you actually have the power. Uh, you really do. Uh, so I would encourage you guys to sort of, as you think about this and other, other, other kinds of research you might participate in, like to just remember like, you know, you're in charge um, and, and you, you can control how this goes. So, so thank you guys for doing all, for everything you're doing. Well, just for your own information, I think we had uh, at least 120 people on the call. Great. Terrific. Um, maybe yeah. more. And, and I have a feeling that when <laughs> us two sends out the recording, there'll be a lot more people that this reaches. So just one last time, if somebody wants to participate and they hear it on the recording, what do they do, Ellie? They go to mpcproject.org. M is in Mary, P is in Paul, C is in Cat, project.org. Uh, and then click count me in and we'll take it from there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time thank you guys. tonight. Thank of course, you. thank you guys. Uh, and everyone has a nice evening. Good night. Good night, thank, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Are you going to close down the whole thing, Rick, or are you going to... Uh, yes, I am right now. Let me stop the recording. <clears throat>